more inventory, strong sales, but the market just feels slow. I've come up with a new idea for a tracking metric that might just be the data point that we need in order to be the first to know about market swings and most importantly, market slowdowns. Plus, plus home ownership, it's not for everyone. We're gonna talk about that and place your bets. Which American city is gonna be the first to collapse? Will it be Los Angeles, Chicago, or New York City? In this video, we're going to go over the single family market and condo market in the state of Massachusetts. And we're also going to do an interest rate update. Plus, we're going to talk about some relevant current events. Hi, I'm Jeff Chubb. I'm a recovering investment banker turned real estate agent. I've sold more than a thousand houses. If you have any questions in regards to real estate, then no, I'm here to help. Two quick highlights. We buy houses all over Massachusetts for cash and fast or slow closing timelines. If you know of anyone that's looking to sell and doesn't want to go through that hassles of the traditional way, then have them visit cashofferma.com or take a look at all the information below and give me a call there. Speaking of good old fashioned traditional way, we now offer our economy selling program of selling for 1% instead of the traditional 5 or 6%. Do you know of anyone that's thinking about selling their house and wanting to save maybe possibly tens of thousands of dollars? Then I'd love to chat with phone. Let's jump into the single family market stats. All things are right in this world all over again. Inventory, it's gone up in the single family market. There are 3,428 single family houses on the market in the state of Massachusetts. And we now have 7.5% more homes on the market today than just 28 days ago. Now more inventory, it's coming. You can count on that and might as well bank on that as well. Now that it is all normalized, that Easter is finally over from that this year as well as last year, right? The inventory gap, the statistics, it's it widening all over again. And I really do think that we're going to be seeing more of this because the market, it just feels slow. We now have 291 more houses on the market when compared to the same week last year and 524 more houses on the market today than compared back in 2022. And this is great news for home buyers, but don't get me wrong. It comes at a time that, well, home buyers aren't getting some great news. They're actually getting a lot of bad news on the rate side, but nonetheless, this is still great news. This was a strong week for new listings. This week, we listed 1,046 single-family homes in the state of Massachusetts. Now, this is 85 units, or 8.8% more than the same week back in 2023. And that four-week rolling average is 946 units. Under agreements, they pulled back this week. This week, we put 948 houses under agreement. Yes, it pulled back, but 948 units is still a pretty respectable number. This week, we put 83 units or 8.1% fewer homes under agreement than the same week last year. We put 1,031 single family homes under agreement. Now that four week rolling average, it's 830 units. So when compared to last year's market, new listings were down by 8.8% while under agreements, they were down by 8.1%. Now the new metric I was talking about, I wanna start comparing new listings from two weeks ago and compare them to the amount of houses that went under agreement last week. Our paper, I just think this could help identify a market shift far before any other alarming indicators. So we're gonna take the 948 units that went under agreement this week, and we're gonna compare them to the 989 units that were newly listed last week. This means we're gonna get a pendings to new listings ratio of 95.9% this week, but this is compared to the 88.6% last week. So what am I looking for here? Well, if we start seeing a trend where this is going down, then I ultimately think that this is, will be the first alarm bell of a softening market. There were 593 single family homes that closed last week for an average sales price of $857,000 and a median sales price of $660,000. Sales levels compared to the same week last year were actually up by 9% as there were 544 single family homes that closed this week last year for an average sales price of $764,000. Now that's three out of the last four weeks where the average sales price has been in the $800,000 range. Big numbers, lots of inventory. This is how we determine what type of market we're in. Zero to five months is considered a seller's market with the closer that you get to zero, the stronger and more aggressive of a seller's market that it is. So this week, months of inventory is actually up to 1.95 months from last week's 1.85 months. Now the 1.95 months this week is compared to the 1.74 months this week last year. And fun fact, we'd actually have to go back to the week of May 22nd back in 2023 to find a week that had months of inventory equal or higher than this week. 
real quick, it's my shameless plug. I just wanted to mention that if you are thinking about buying or selling a house, then it would be a true pleasure to help you. Now, onto the condo market. We have 2,365 condos on the market as of Monday. Not a huge gain, but the gains continue. This is 12.1% more than the inventory levels on the market just 28 days ago. Now, we continue to catch up to that 2021 inventory level mark. And keep in mind, what was going on back in 2021? COVID. That was a soft market for condos. We now have 183 more units on the market today than today last year. Meanwhile, we have 431 more units that compared to the inventory levels of 2022 and are only 187 units short of 2021's inventory levels. Putting myself out there, I'm putting myself on the line here, but I think we're going to catch up to 2021's inventory levels in the condo market sometime in May. There were 517 condos that came on the market last week with that four-week rolling average of 505 units. Now, the 517 units listed was 22 units or 4.1% less than the 539 condos that came on the market this same week back in 2023. And under agreements were exactly equal to last week. This week, we put 448 units under agreement. And this 448 condo sales was 60 units or 11.8% less than last year when we put 508 condos under agreement. At four-week rolling average for under agreements, it's 415 units. So 4.1% fewer listings that came on the market when compared to this week last year while selling 11.8% fewer condos. Now, the condo pendings to new listing ratio was 85% this week. This is up from 75.6% last week. And I think it's here in the condo market where I can really see the help of this metric and this statistic. The average in March was 92.6%. In other words, 92.6% of the listed inventory was being absorbed by buyers in March. That number is 84.3% so far for the month of April. There were 262 condos that sold this week for an average sales price of $693,000 and a median sales price of $542,000. This same week last year, there were 257 condos that sold. So sales levels were down by 2%. Months of inventory, it jumped to 2.86 months from last week's 2.78 months. This is compared to the months of inventory levels of 2.45 months this week last year. And this is the highest level for months of inventory that I have seen since I started keeping track of this weekly data beginning back in 2022. Could we soon be talking about a balanced condo market? A balanced market is months of inventory between five and seven months. A balanced market is where neither buyer nor seller has pricing power. What do you think? Throw your comments, throw your opinion in that comment section below. Any chance you can do me a huge favor? Can you hit that like button? It's right down there, believe it or not. It just makes a huge difference for me in the channels. It just plays with that YouTube algorithm. And while subscribing, that one doesn't hurt either. So if you haven't subscribed and you're liking the content, then please consider subscribing. But it's time to talk about interest rates. Last week, it was raw. The stable interest rates this week is very welcome news. But for how much longer? Is this going to last? I'm starting to see more and more people talk about higher inflation and the possibility of the Fed increasing interest rates. It's something that we've been talking about for a while now. So I'm pretty pumped that, well, the world's catching up. Check out what CNBC is saying, though. Mortgage rates are now at the highest level of the year and could still climb. I thought it was interesting that even with rates higher, mortgage applications actually increased by 5% when compared to the week earlier. Now, they mentioned by mid-February, a pickup in inflation reset expectations, putting mortgage rates on an upward trend, and more recent data and comments from Powell have only underscored inflation concerns. They also mentioned that anyone waiting for rates to drop significantly may just be waiting for a while and that the recent economic data shows that the economy and job market remain strong, which is likely to keep mortgage rates at these elevated levels for the near future. First, it's time to reset the narrative and put things in perspective. 7% on an interest rate isn't high when you look at it at a historically basis. Rates aren't going back to the 2 or 3 or 4%. Not really sure if they should go back into the 5s either. Free money, it's not a good thing because that's how you get bubbles. And we all remember the pain of the last bubble back in 2008, but from where I'm sitting, from the history of the 70s that I've studied, we are now seeing inflation second run. These idiots all took the victory lap way too early, and it's not the Fed's fault, really. 
It's Washington's, as they continue to stimulate the economy with these blowout deficits and drastically increasing the money supply in the process. The solution is not hard, but the reality of the solution is painful, which is why those spyless cowards will actually do anything about it. Inflation, it's going to get worse. Count on it. CNBC also wrote an article highlighting an author saying that home ownership, it's not for everyone. This author, they're a money coach. Now, I agree with her. Home ownership, it's not for everyone, but she's an idiot. Let's talk why. So, yes, home ownership, it's not for everyone. If you're moving every two or three years, then it's much, much better to rent. A two year window is just too short of a timeline for it to really make sense to own. But if you're new to a market also and don't really know the area and where it would be the best fit for your needs, then 100% you should definitely rent. Okay, according to the article, this entrepreneurship coach actually helps clients pursue financial independence. Can you please explain to me what type of financial independence you can achieve by being a renter your entire life? There's a theory that the world economic planners who look at all of us as numbers don't want us to own anything. And the more I look and the more I think about it, it's kind of becoming less and less of a theory. I mean, today people don't even own their cell phones. People literally lease these $1,200 cell phones so they can have the newest and the greatest just in two years. Now I'm in the camp that if you don't have the discipline of owning your cell phone, then owning a house probably isn't for you. And based off of Janice's quote from a value perspective, you have to really be honest with yourself. Does this suit my lifestyle? Do I want to stay in this place for like a decade or more? Or do I want the flexibility to give my landlord 30 days notice and be able to move somewhere else? I'm thinking she doesn't own her cell phone. It's called being an adult, making a tough decision and sacrificing some enjoyment today for the stability and the luxuries of tomorrow. I love where she mentioned the narrative where if you get a mortgage, then you're going to be paying the same amount of money forever, and that's why you should buy a home. Well, her answer to that, absolutely not. Your property taxes and insurance, they're going to increase. Hey, Denise, newsflash, as a renter, you actually pay for the increases in property taxes and insurance as well. Yes, owning a home isn't for everyone. If it's more important to have a flashy hat than the actual cattle, then being a renter for the rest of your life, continue to lease your phone, Continue to lease your car, lease the apartment and own nothing. But just know that the longer you stay on that hamster wheel, the harder it's going to be to get off. And eventually, you're not going to be able to get off at all. But if you'd rather be the guy or gal with lots of cattle and not worried about the fancy hat, then make the sacrifice of missing out on that fancy vacation today for the luxury of many fancy vacations in the future. Buy a house, make it a home, and plan on living in it for at least 7 to 10 years. That's a tangent, but I just couldn't believe my eyes as I read this advice from someone who actually gets paid to help people achieve financial independence. And by the way, Janice, as a so-called entrepreneurship coach, business is all about investing today for future returns tomorrow. That's what us entrepreneurs do. The investment today is what we hope will give us the financially independent future. I just feel bad for those coaching clients. So place your bets. I was reading an article about the collapse of some of the greatest American cities. Policies of these cities, so-called leaders, have given way to a city of crime, filth, and in Chicago's case, the newest title of the rattiest city in the U.S. by Orkin's annual ranking. Who would have thought they had one of those? Companies and tax-paying citizens are fleeing these cities for greener pastures, allowing people to shoplift. It's just going to create an environment of serial shoplifters, which will make the businesses need to close up shop. The business leaves, so therefore the law-abiding citizens lose out and ultimately end up leaving as well. This means the city loses the tax revenue, not only from the business, but also from the residents that leave. <laughs> it's a nasty cycle. And now, add in the expense of providing sanctuary to the folks that have illegally jumped our border. These cities, they're out of money, and it's a race to the bottom. So let's hear it in the comment section below. Which city is going to collapse first? Will it be LA, will it be New York, or will it be Chicago? Oh, and you may be asking yourself, how does this revolve around Massachusetts real estate? Well, not really Massachusetts, but it's easy. It's a recommendation to not own real estate there, maybe possibly buy here. Want to talk about your own personal real estate needs? Again, it's Jeff Chubb. Whether you're looking to buy or sell a home in the next nine or 90 days, then I would love to chat with you and just find out a little bit more about your real estate goals. And if you know of anyone 
that's thinking about buying or selling a house that I truly appreciate you passing along my contact information. You can visit youtuberealestateagent.com or find all of my contact information in the description below. Until next time.